three, three, two. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, if you're in the Philippines, Maganda Kapon. Um, on behalf of the British Council, allow me to welcome you to this webinar on writing a research proposal for international collaboration. My name is Pilar Aramayo and I am the country director of the British Council in the Philippines. Thank you very much for making the time to join us this afternoon uh, or this morning if you're in the UK. Uh, before we proceed, let me tell you a little bit about ourselves, about the British Council, about uh, the Newton programme, and, and then I'll let you carry on with the webinars. So uh, the British Council, as you probably know, is the UK's organisation for cultural relations and educational opportunities. Um, our work is about building connections and understanding and trust between people of the UK and other countries. We work in over 100 countries in the fields of education, arts and culture, English language and civil society. The UK excellence in research and innovation attracts collaboration from across the world. And we believe that by working together, strengthening the world's research ecosystems, we can find solutions to major global challenges such as food security, climate change and now most obviously human health and the Newton Fund is an example of how we do this around the world. In the Philippines we established the Newton Ackham Fund in 2015 um, to help advance research and innovation in the areas of life sciences, environmental resilience, energy security, future cities, agri-tech, uh, innovation and creativity um, by working in collaboration with government agencies uh, such as the Commission of Higher Education, uh, the Department of Science and Technology, DOST, and more recently the Department of Agriculture. Now this online activity that we have prepared for you today uh, is one of our initiatives under the Newton Ackham program. Uh, through this two-part webinar, we hope that future researchers uh, will learn how to succeed and how to, to successfully apply for international partnerships in the future. I wish, first of all, to thank our speakers, Dr. Manuel Tairit from the Ateneo School of Medicine and Public Health and Professor Cameron Johnston from the University of Strathclyde for sharing their expertise and experience as Newton Ackham research recipients. Um, I would also like to make a few, a few announcements. Um, so if you're a leading researcher on sustainable aquaculture or in biological biomass feedstock and you're interested in conducting a workshop with an international audience, uh, you can immediately or you will be able to immediately apply what you learn through these um, webinars because at the moment uh, we're accepting applications for our Newton Ackham Research Links workshop in partnership with the Department of Agriculture Biotechnology. The deadline for applications is quite tight, it's the 12th of June, so if you're interested please hurry and do apply and as I said you can use um, everything you will learn in these webinars uh, for your applications. Um, I'd also like to announce um, that the Universities UK International uh, is offering their assistance in connecting Filipino researchers with prospective research partners in the UK uh, for this call. So the Newton team, um, Danny, uh, Tessa and Lotus, who are also on this, on this um, live uh, session, um, will help you to coordinate regarding this opportunity to collaborate with UK institutions um, with the same research interests as yourselves. Um, before before um, we begin the webinar, uh, I'd just like to say that, that this webinar is um, part of a wider initiative that we currently have um, at the British Council in the UK and 
and, and also in East Asia to explore and understand the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on education. So it is with the expertise of our partners in the UK and in East Asia that we will be conducting a series of webinars and different topics uh, in education, such as transnational education, research collaborations and teaching and learning. Uh, so please do visit our website, uh, that's www.britishcouncil.ph and follow our social media pages uh, at PH British uh, to learn more about the latest opportunities that we're offering. Uh, once again, thank you very much for attending this webinar, for, for giving us your, your time. I know there are plenty of opportunities to take all sorts of webinars and opportunities online these days. Thank you for choosing us. Uh, I hope uh, you um, get the most out of it and we're very much looking forward to receiving your application soon. Thank you. Thank you, Pilar. Let me introduce myself. I am Danny Song Gonzalvo, the program manager for the Newton Fund at the British Council, or the Newton Agham, as we call it in the Philippines. I am going to moderate the webinar for this afternoon. Let me share my slide. I'd like to share a few reminders or house rules before we begin. First, please be informed that this webinar is being recorded and while speakers are in session, you may send your comments and questions to, ask, to the Ask a Question button on the bottom right hand part of the screen. Please remember to indicate um, to whom you are addressing the questions to and let our questions be centered to the topic this afternoon. In asking also, you may introduce yourself and your institution, or you can ask the questions anonymously. Please refrain from spamming or sending harmful links, and please accomplish the post-webinar assessment form that we will email as the session ends. Finally, a summary report will be shared to attendees and to others who have registered but were unable to join. The British Council complies with data protection law in the UK and laws in other countries that meet internationally accepted standards. You have the right to ask for a copy of the information we hold on you and the right to ask us to, correctly, to, to correct any inaccuracies in that information. If you have concerns about how we have used your personal information, you also have the right to complain to a privacy regulator. Now, allow me to introduce the resource persons this afternoon. The first speaker is Dr. Manuel Derit. Dr. Derit is a professor and former dean at the Ateneo School of Medicine and Public Health. Prior to this, Dr. Derit also served as director for the Department of Human Resources for Health at the World Health Organization. He also served as secretary for the Philippine Department of Health. He will be followed by Professor Cameron Johnstone, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Strathclyde, United Kingdom. He also served as director at the Energy Systems Research Unit at the same institution. Dr. Derit and Dr. Johnstone are also recipients of the Newton Agham Institutional Links Grant, a two-year collaboration between Philippine and UK researchers to study development needs and challenges in the country. Now, I'm going to let um, let us hear from uh, Dr. Manuel Derit. Dr. Derit. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, good afternoon to friends in the Philippines and to uh, friends in the UK. I will uh, show my slides now. Hang on, let me just share my screen. Okay.
Are you able to see my screen now? Uh, Danny, can you see my screen? Not yet, not yet. Okay, let me try again. Uh, while Dr. Dairit is sharing, um, trying, um, sharing his screen, I'd like to also um, acknowledge our attendees from different part of the, parts of the Philippines. We have attendees from um, Cagayan Valley, from uh, Las Banas, Laguna. We have colleagues from uh, the UP Las Banas. We also have attendees from Benguet, um, Philippines and other um, parts of the Philippines. So um, to, uh, to the attendees this afternoon, if um, you may send your um, your welcome uh, message to 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 the uh, Q and A button below, right? Dr. Uh, Danny, your uh, now. okay. Uh, hang on. No? Can you see it now? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you all very much. And um, what I'm going to be presenting to you are two projects that actually we developed over the last five years. One of them was a workshop and another was an institutional links. Now, um, the first three slides will actually give you a summary of what you need to learn. And let me begin just by talking about uh, setting up, setting up for a for international collaboration. Essentially, in our case, and we began this as early as uh, 2015, it really began with an idea, a, a passion. And at that time, we really had uh, this passion to improve healthcare in the country. Universal healthcare was an idea. It was being adopted by countries. But having a workshop with people, particularly in the UK, who might understand what universal health care was about. Considering that in the UK, they have a national health service. We know that the government covers a lot of the health care for people, and we needed to understand more about that. And therefore, there was constant discussion and brainstorming with team members. It was really me as a dean and one staff member who was also very passionate about this idea. So for those of you out there, you could be one person, maybe even just two persons, but you have to incubate this idea for what you want to do. In the course of this discussion and brainstorming, we eventually decided to actually apply for this uh, Newton Fund grant. And actually at the time, the Newton Fund didn't exist yet. And this is where serendipity came about. The staff member I was working with, who was a graduate of the Ateneo School of Medicine and Public Health, was interested in doing a PhD. And he was hunting around for funds. And in the course of hunting around for funds, he stumbled on the British Council and this Newton Fund. And therefore, in the course of all of this, me and my staff member, we were discussing we then decided to write the proposal. And really, the strength of the proposal begins with this. A very clear idea, simply explained. Very succinct and very straight to the point. When you see the form that you have to fill out in the British Council website for this idea, it's actually very, very simple. You have to be able to distill the key concepts describe it properly and be able to convince the person on the other side who's reading your proposal that there is merit to your proposal. Of course, that proposal has to be on priority. And at the time, the British Council had health as its priority. I think this year it's agriculture. And therefore, in our case, health was a priority. Universal health care was socially relevant. We saw that the idea of a workshop was feasible. 
and we had local implementers that we could identify who are willing and able to work with us. And these were particularly the mentors that would be involved in the workshop. And we were also able to identify UK collaborators. And let me explain this a little bit more. Essentially, this had to do with my personal contacts because I had studied in the UK. I, in fact, was a British Council scholar. And through the course of the years, I built professional colleagues in the UK, particularly at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And therefore, I actually did a phone call to the director there. He was outgoing. And that was the serendipitous event. Uh, he was willing to pass on this idea to somebody in the school who might be willing to adopt it. And therefore, we ended up writing this proposal with colleagues from the UK. And this is where we then proceeded to establish that collaboration. Um, as I said, we tapped the professional and academic networks, both locally in the Philippines and internationally. What was very important was to see and to make sure that the institution at the other side particularly in the UK, had a mutual interest in your idea. If that, and that was the case, because uh, the researchers at the London School were studying universal health care in various countries. So and therefore, we were able to, undef yes, Sorry. we were able um, to identify the principal investigators and build a partnership among collaborators. Dr. Terry, please and, uh, tell us if, um, if, if we need to, uh, to change the slides, we can uh, oh, remove the slides as we go. Yeah, because I'm actually changing it already. I'm sorry. I'm in the slide on establishing collaboration. Yeah, OK. There okay. you go. So, uh, please okay. um, say, say next, sir, if um, we have to next. Well. OK, so next then. Uh, so is this the slide then on the stories of the new Newton Fund projects? Is that the slide? Yes. yes OK, so let me describe then the two projects. The first project is the Researcher Links Workshop on Universal Healthcare. And then I'm going to describe a second project, which is the Institutional Links Project on Primary Care. Next slide. Now, this is a picture of the Newton Fund Research Links uh, personalities that eventually joined the workshop in January 2016. And you can see that in this case, this is a mix of 15 Filipino researchers and 15 UK young researchers. That was what the workshop was about. Next slide. But see, it started with an email inquiry between the Newton Fund and us. And this was my collaborator, a person named uh, Dr. Harvey Liwanag, who was then looking for a PhD. Next slide. There was an exchange of emails with the British Embassy. The Newton Fund was launched in the Philippines in September 2014, three months after our first email exchange. That was the serendipitous part. Ateneo was invited to the launch, and as a result of that, we then committed ourselves to make an application. Next slide. And this is how it developed. My dedicated staff worked with me. We chose a workshop that would discuss UHC or universal healthcare in the Philippines. And it was a socially relevant topic because three or four years later, uh, the Congress would then discuss this and eventually a law would be passed in 2019. Next slide. So these were the collaborators in the UK. This was me. And I had a colleague, Professor Andy Haynes from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, whom I called and referred me to Professor Kara Hanson. OK, and working with Kara, everything fell into place and we developed the concept of the workshop. You know, it's very interesting that eventually my uh, collaborator here, uh, the local, 
uh, Dr. Harvey Liwanag, eventually went on to do a PhD in Switzerland, and Professor Kara Hanson was one of his external mentors. Next slide. And we then rallied around key people around uh, this workshop, and you can see their pictures here. We were able to find somebody, uh, uh, Professor Quigley, Professor Jeff Wong from Oxford, and then we had local mentors, uh, Dr. Madeline Valera and Dr. Oscar Picasso, who is a health economist, and then junior researchers, both from the UK and from the Philippines. And there are the picture of the UK staff who were providing support and guidance to us. So eventually, uh, we paid attention to the detail based on the guidance of the British Council staff, as you can see from here. Next slide. And eventually, we had a successful application and we were notified in 2015. Next slide. And so in 2016, January, 15 early career researchers from the Philippines and 15 early career researchers from the UK convened in Manila for this workshop. Next slide. And these are the pictures of the workshop. Three busy days analyzing universal health care in the Philippines. Uh, on your lower left, there's a picture of Professor Wong. Uh, there's the professor on the lower right of Professor uh, Lahida Quigley. And then you can see us debating all of the issues. Next slide. And eventually we culminated in a high level policy dialogue with decision makers to produce and to, to communicate to them the product of the workshop. So eventually, in hindsight, what made the application successful? Early preparation and guidance from the British Embassy and the British Council, that was very clear. We had selected a highly relevant choice of topic. Three years later, a new UHC law was to be enacted, and we were able to identify strategic collaborators from the UK as well as from the Philippines. And we had well met motivated and dedicated staff who have prepared the proposal. So that ends this part where I talked about the, the workshop. The second project had to do with an institutional fund. And here the process was the same. And this is the title of that project, Transforming Primary Care in the Philippines, an innovative pilot professional development program for primary care physicians in the province of Northern Samar. Note, this was a bit more complicated. And here we had collaborators in the Philippines, Northern Samar, okay? And uh, we had to meet with the governor. Next slide. And this is a picture of the people that came to the Philippines. And you can see Danny Son there standing on the right, upper. Uh, the, the person on the, on the front row encircled, that's the congressman from Northern Samar. Beside him, on his, on his left, is Professor Andiki Hassel of Kiel University. We were able to establish a partnership with Kiel University indirectly. I did not know Professor Hassel personally. And to my left, the lady in red, was the vice president of Ateneo de Manila and encircled in the back where the British Council uh, persons who supported us, uh, Mr. Ran and of course, Danny Son. So let me just run through very quickly the slides of this. Uh, well, this is when we got the award from CHED, uh, the Commission of Higher Education, which was managing the fund here in the Philippines. Next slide. This was the philosophy for that project. Quality primary care is essential to universal health care and primary care physicians, primary care needs good primary physicians. Next slide. And this was the goal. Our goal was to strengthen rural health physicians in the country, but particularly focusing first on Northern Samar, which was the focus of this project. Next slide. This is the governor of Samar. On the left, uh, Governor Jose Ong, and we visited him. This is Professor Andy Hassel. And then this very briefly just gives you the life cycle of that project. We began with the literature review, we had an ethnographic study, we had conferences, and eventually at the end of it, 
we developed a curriculum to train rural health physicians to improve their capacity as primary care physicians. Next slide. And so these were the main features of that curriculum. I, I don't want to dwell on that. These were the areas of competencies that we developed. And you can see in the middle uh, column, the areas of competence that we wanted our rural health physicians to get supplementary training on. Next slide. Now, this project allowed us to go to the UK. And so we visited Kiel, and this is a picture of Kiel. We were able to look at primary care in the UK and understand how they were doing primary care. We were able to meet a primary care physician. This is actually Mary Makshari, who is the wife of Professor Andy Hassel. We were able to visit our general practice there in Kiel, and we were able to understand better how primary care was actually functioning in the UK. And we were able to do a benchmarking of their system with the Philippine system, particularly understanding how the primary physician was trained and how that primary physician worked. In the UK, they called that physician a general practitioner. This gives you an idea of a uh, general practice clinic in the UK and an idea of the UK training program in primary care. Uh, I hope you've kept up with the slides. Uh, I'm now here on UK training in primary care and showed you the, 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 the different uh, steps in which a general practitioner is trained in the UK. Next slide. And so finally, this is a visit of the Kiel team to Northern Samar in September of 2017. We finally ended the project in 2019, uh, very successful. Uh, we're still writing up the results of the project and hope to publish uh, our results. Last slide. Now, in 2019, the universal health care law was signed and in a sense, uh, you might say that our institutional links project contributed in some way to for us to understand how we can better prepare our primary physicians for universal health care. And finally, in hindsight, last slide, what made the application successful? A highly relevant choice of topic. Three years later, a new UHC law was enacted. Identification of strategic collaborators in the UK commitment and energy of the principal investigators and certainly well-motivated and dedicated staff who prepared the proposal and did all of the details in order to make it successful. So thank you all very much and uh, good afternoon, good day to everyone. Dani, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Derry. Maraming salamat. Now, um, as uh, Professor Johnstone prepares his um, presentation, I'd like to invite everybody to send your questions and or comments to um, directed to uh, Dr. Dairit, who uh, will be going to answer um, some of them as we proceed to the question and answer after uh, Professor Johnstone gives his um, presentation. But um, let me also acknowledge our friends, our attendees from different parts of the Philippines. We have people attending from Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, from um, Davao City, people from uh, Palawan State Agricultural University. We have attendees from the Dumaguete City, Mabarakat City, Bukidnon State University, um, from Pampanga, uh, Philippines, Pampanga State Agricultural University. We have um, attendees from Bicol, um, Partido State University in the Bicol region, um, in the University of um, San Carlos in Cebu, and the Tarlac Agricultural University, to name a few. So um, welcome everybody, and I hope that um, we continue to learn as uh, Professor John Stone uh, continues with uh, the presentation. Professor Cameron. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Danny. Um, I'll share my screen. Uh, hopefully, you can see this. Have you? Can you 
see the screen okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, th uh, thank you, Danny, and uh, sort of, well, good afternoon. Uh, so everyone in the Philippines and for anyone that's in the, the UK, good morning. Um, as sort of part of the sort of webinar, I've uh, sort of been asked to sort of give a perspective from a UK partner uh, involved in uh, sort of the Newton Fund uh, sort of programme. Um, so our university is University of Strathclyde. My name is Cameron Johnston and sort of I am the director of the Energy Systems Research Unit. Um, which uh, undertakes research into sort of energy supply systems, but also energy demand and looking at how to optimize and improve uh, the performance of these systems. So within the context of uh, sort of today's uh, sort of meeting, uh, I've been asked to cover specific points uh, regarding the, the program uh, sort of you're applying for and making sure that your proposal adheres to the ODE, ODA, well, that's Overseas Development Agency, and other eligibility statements and go on and sort of give a perspective on uh, sort of UK partners uh, sort of involvement in these programs. So specifically, I'll be covering points. What does ODA sort of eligibility require? Uh, how do you relate what your program of work is planning to these ODA requirements? And then go on from a UK perspective. Why now sort of what is the value? Why uh, should we sort of now jointly collaborate in sort of these initiatives? Uh, and ultimately, what made sort of sort of my team decides uh, to engage in partner in the Philippines and then go on and sort of elaborate more on the application process itself uh, and how you sort of set out uh, your application and structure it. So moving on, I will then, uh, so, so when we talk about the ODA eligibility and ultimately that that's the, the ultimate goal and before you just sit down and start sort of sketching out your proposal, you should think about what your research is doing and identify whether it addresses uh, any of these specific bullet points, which are the key ODA eligibility requirements. So is the project addressing economic development and welfare? Uh, are sort of the countries involved on the DAC list uh, of ODA uh, recipients, uh, the, is, it a cre is it this credible or is there evidence of the need for what you're proposing, especially in the country that you're looking to undertake the research? Uh, what would the impact of the project or activity be? And ultimately, who would be the beneficiaries of that work? So there's a clear list that's published by the ODA. So uh, Sort of, so please consider that when you're beginning to scope you know, sort of your proposal and how you would be looking to respond specifically to the Newton Fund call. Moving on, that's ODA examples. So when we start looking at ODA eligibility, sort of how do your ODA requirements relate to your project plan? You've got to think of your timelines, your outputs and your outcome. Um, when, when you're writing your proposal, just don't think about this is what I'm going to do in my proposal and therefore write that proposal. You've got to clearly scope what the uh, sort of short term objectives are. And typically that would be the duration of the sort of the, the, the research uh, program that you would be undertaking. So you're looking at just wanting to identify what is the research that you know, sort of you as a, you know, your, your team will undertake. Uh, what are the actual tangible outputs and deliverables from that? And how does this feed or address the challenge uh, associated with the ODA 
uh, eligibility list. But it, it, as I said, you don't just sort of think of it in that context. You've also got to look at the uh, sort of medium and longer term benefits associated with your proposed research. So that's now your, uh, your post project implementation phase, which would typically be three years uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of after your or sort of three within three years of your project completion. So in that context, you're looking at with all the success that comes out from the research, how do you then apply that the deliverables of these outputs and now how would you get them out there uh, into uptake? So sort of how and, uh, and how do you evaluate the, the ultimate performance? There's one thing doing research, but you've got to look at the performance of that research once it's getting out into the uh, sort of wider network. Um, so uh, sort of that might well be scale demonstration of the output, so a scale trial of something. Then think of now you've got to sort of think of the longer term aspects of that, i.e. three years after the end of the project. So now when it, now so you'd be looking for that to become uh, sort of wider engaged and sort of with the wider society, wider community. And therefore that's roots for that wider uptake you've got to consider. Uh, and now sort of identification of the wider impacts and benefits. And it's especially in that context, you want to look at the social benefits, the economic benefits, the environmental benefits, community benefits, etc. So it's not just the sort of what would be the detailed specific benefits and the sort of advancements in knowledge and science, but it's how it impacts and how you deliver that impact into wider society. So that, that's by doing that, that's you then satisfying the ODA eligibility criteria. Now, looking at uh, sort of from a UK perspective, uh, especially as a, a partner uh, sort of uh, based in the UK, engaging uh, with partners in the Philippines. Now, why uh, sort of why did we engage in, in these Newton Fund uh, on this Newton Fund project that we're just about to start. And uh, now sort of if you if you go back now sort of as academics, we're all engaged in research and advancing science and understanding. But it's important in the UK that we go beyond just advancing science. We actually have to look at how that new understanding has a positive impact in society. So when we submit research proposals to our UK research councils, an increasing part of that proposal is not just about the outcomes, but it's how we utilise these outcomes and how now sort of for societal benefit. So key for any UK application to UK research councils is what we call impact acceleration, because what we do will have a, a big impact on society or could have a big impact on society. So we ha now have to address how we sort of, uh, sort of address that and actually get out there uh, with our new understanding or new knowledge or new science. So in that context, these outputs from research activities, these sort of blue sky fundamental research, uh, sort of the, these solutions do have wider applicability beyond just what might be local in a part of the UK or the, in the UK itself. It's got potentially ev now everything has global impact. So the Newton Fund itself provides a great opportunity for engagement on that international platform and sort of and, and share and collaborate and enhance these fundamental sort of research outputs that are coming from UK research programmes. So it's very complementary and synergistic to the ultimate research journey that researchers will undertake. But also when you start looking at the, the wider impact, there is a greater need for 
increasing the capacity and understanding of the research team, especially when we start looking at local applicability. And therefore, we've got to then start expanding and including new knowledge and understanding of local environments and uh, which would guide the applicability of this research knowledge to that specific uh, sort of locality. And therefore, that's there's again a, a considerable benefit of the sort of again the Newton Fund uh, sort of activities because it is all about collaboration, building capacity, international sort of capacity for the application of good science. So then now sort of so from a UK perspective, there's a greater drive for researchers to be better engaged in the now specifically in the applicability of research outputs. So collaboration and international engagement is now at the core of all research agendas. And obviously, and sort of when you start looking at international applicability, that's what gives it real world meaning. And ultimately, that real world sort of applicability to find out where the challenges are in applying that new science and new understanding, feeding that back in to refine is vital. And ultimately, that's core to the British Council's Newton Fund programmes. And of course, the ultimate reason for that delivery is for a good and positive impact in society. And that's going back to the ODA uh, sort of eligibility criteria. What is the impact, the wider impact of the research that you're going to do? It's not just about doing research, it's also looking at the, the impact in society, wider societal impact of that research. And that, again, that's key to sort of Newton Fund uh, sort of projects. So the research impact itself uh, sort of is as I said, is a very sort of important driver today in the research landscape. The sort of uh, now when we talk about research impact, we're looking at the applicability of these outcomes, whether it's through uh, sort of guiding policy, governmental or uh, sort of regional policy development, or whether it's actually hardware that's being produced. Uh, and, and therefore delivering product that has a positive impact in society, or whether in the context of sort of medicine, it's actually addressing the, the new challenges and uh, sort of again, getting that into the field in order to resolve the challenges that they're uh, sort of being addressed in field. So again, these are centre and core to the Newton Fund ethos, getting that sort of new knowledge, new science out there to address the uh, wider societal impacts. What may does as sort of uh, now Ezra at the University of Strathclyde uh, sort of engage in sort of the Newton Fund? Well, while we have existing UK research and sort of European research sort of uh, visi visibility and profile. Um, it's looking at that wider international profile in sort of Southeast Asia, uh, sort of America, etc. And in the context of our work, we work very sort of now sort of focused on the marine renewable energy applications. So that's looking at a sort of energy extraction from the seas uh, around our coastlines. And therefore, one now sort of I actually have a PhD researcher who's from the University of the Philippines uh, working with me at present. And uh, for that was the initial uh, sort of introduction uh, of uh, our team in the UK to uh, sort of the sort of uh, complementary uh, skill sets that exist in research skill sets in the Philippines. Um, but of course, that required additional uh, sort of enhancement uh, sort of within country expertise. 
So when we were uh, sort of looking through our uh, sort of programme of work, we had identified what uh, sort of key universities in the Philippines that uh, now worked in the energy environment sector, especially with coastal communities and complemented our skill, skill sets. So we built on the existing relationship we had with the University of the Philippines uh, and uh, sort of went on and sort of, uh, sort of developed our uh, sort of programme of work around that. We, as part of that, uh, we had to expand that local research knowledge uh, and engage with the uh, research leaders in the Philippines and in, uh, sort of in, in sort of embrace and sort of integrate the uh, sort of complementary research skill sets that they brought to the team as well. So the, as I mentioned earlier, the area was marine renewables and also looking at how we can utilise that to satisfy community uh, demands. On an earlier visit to the Philippines, we've seen that uh, some of the islands were off grid and they were using diesel generators and they had a lot of challenges associated with uh, getting diesel to the shore, basically having to hand uh, sort of uh, lift it off of boats uh, up the beach uh, to, to the store, etc. And of course, they had a lot of diesel spillage as well. Um, so looking at this sort of renewable policies, the increase of renewables, then this gave us a great opportunity to look at marine renewables and the applicability to meet the energy demands of communities. And it's high value to both UK. There's a lot of emphasis in the UK just now maximising renewable energy, especially from the seas. And of course, the Philippines but also beyond as well, because it's a general it's a challenge that a lot of countries with coastal uh, sort of exposure are having to address. So if we're successful in addressing the challenges that we've identified in the project, then the outputs have global applicability, as I mentioned, extending beyond the Philippines into Southeast Asia, uh, sort of Northeast Asia. Asia into the Americas and Latin America, etc. So what we're doing does have global impact. In the UK, now sort of, we work very closely with uh, Cardiff University. We've got complementary skill sets in this uh, sort of uh, now subject area. But in the Philippines, as I mentioned, we had to identify the complementary skill sets and the expertise and, 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 sort of in, and, 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 and sort of integrate that into our research team. And that was uh, sort of our partners from the Ateneo de Davao University and also University of the Philippines uh, are our sort of two core partners um, <coughs> in the Philippines uh, there. In integrating uh, the partnership to get the sort of synergies that we now ultimately we bring uh, to the proposals uh, and to the programme of work, then uh, sort of the partner, now all partner attributes, we're looking at experience in the subject area. So demonstrating uh, sort of what uh, sort of track record is important there where you've got that experience um, for, uh, for us. It was the demonstration of potential engage, uh, sort of engagement in Philippines initiatives. So where is now sort of Philippine partners are engaged in sort of initiatives locally, uh, they've got that track record. That's a very strong uh, sort of uh, 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 sort of strong um, uh, capability that they bring to the proposal. That uh, sort of capability and capacity with the track record. Is, is in good publication uh, sort of history is a, a strength that complements the, the skill sets to support the formation of the research teams. Then uh, we're looking that now with the, the sort of good technical skills. So again, through demonstration in local uh, sort of research programs or local programs, uh, sort of basically it's a, a resume of the sort of in-country research uh, sort of capabilities that uh, you're looking to build there in order to get that 
uh, sort of uh, now sort of introduction and building the relationship uh, with uh, the UK and vice versa for the UK with the Philippines. But also important is the interest, enthusiasm and commitments uh, sort of to the subject area. Uh, now, sort of, there's now one thing been able to demonstrate it, but actually demonstrate the enthusiasm and, and sort of t is important, especially in driving forward projects. Uh, you know, sort of, especially ultimately when there is maybe something like seven th sort of eight, uh, six thousand miles um, of a sort of a, of dis distance between uh, the sort of countries, and of course having strong. IT infrastructures is very helpful uh, in the context of communications. An advantage that we find, and it's a very positive advantage, is the time difference. Of course, now we can use the time difference uh, to the benefit of the project. But now, obviously, just now it's in the morning in the UK and it's sort of late afternoon in the Philippines. And uh, sort of within the, the project, when our Philippine partners have come to the end of their working day, they can then email or send us the sort of the progress that they have made at that period. And then when they go home at night, that's the start of our working day. We can pick that up and advance it. And then uh, sort of by the time we get to the end of our working day, we can then ship that back to uh, the Philippines, so when they come in in the morning, they can then pick it up. So now we, we can look at out of a 24 hour day, we can look at something like the region of 17, 18 hours of productivity. Um, so it's actually very beneficial, the, the time difference. And now where we need face to face, there's periods of actually where we actually have physical meetings, but like this, now this morning in the UK, this afternoon in, in the Philippines, uh, using sort of Zoom or Microsoft Teams is a great platform for actually having the team update meetings as well. So the time difference isn't a disadvantage, it can actually be a positive contribution in order to progress the work that you're undertaking. Um, so going on, and as I said, that these uh, sort of video platforms are now uh, sort of good because it means that you can have weekly sort of sort of, uh, sort of two weekly face-to-face uh, -face project meetings when sort of challenges arise. Now, research is, is wonderful because research addresses these challenges, but as the challenges arise, you've got a face-to-face -face video capability that allows you to sort of sort of invest now have joint investigation and scoping how best to address these challenges. So good IT infrastructure uh, is sort of a vital to the success of these programs. Hmm. As far as the application process is concerned, it, it's a I would say it's a well refined and well straight now well structured and relatively straightforward process. Um, as Dr. David did mention, it's now you don't elaborate and you know, sort of go into great detail. You've got to condense the the research message that you want to deliver, and therefore it's important um, now sort of that you do that. But the actual application process is quite efficient and straightforward. In our context, sort of the UK partner took the initial lead in scoping and drafting. Uh, sort of the, the sort of uh, program of work, and then our Philippine partners now sort of now sort of took that over and then put in some detail, uh, especially specific to applicability in the Philippines. So uh, that now sort of that's how we progressed it, and we actually progressed the application quite quickly. Um, the actual submission process. Uh, sort of we submitted last year uh, in the 2019 call. Um, that was one application submitted through the Newton Fund portal and that was then copied to our Philippine partners. And in this sort of last year's context, it was the British Council. Uh, they had received the application and they were 
they were the sort of agency that liaised with DOS, who were the funders on the Philippine side for the Philippine partners, and that was post the submission. So all in all, it was a relatively straightforward, efficient application and uh, sort of uh, preparation and submission process. The application itself, now sort of I've basically sort of structured it into the five key areas. The project summary, and of course what we're saying is you don't be, now that, that shouldn't be verbose and so on, that's short, snappy, and that's now that's basically covering what is it you're doing, how is it you're going to do it, who is involved in doing it, and ultimately why are you doing it? What is not only the scientific output, but why from a societal basis does it have now sort of what impact is it going to have? You then sort of move on into the research project uh, sort of proposal itself, and that is very much sort of a condensed document, and that's detailing the objectives of the specific research activity that you're going to undertake, basically the work packages. Then what are the deliverables from these work packages, i.e. what are the outputs uh, and that you're going to sort of get uh, from these? And the timetable, sort of what is the sort of the number of weeks or months and when within the sort of due, now sort of the overall duration of the project uh, will this be undertaken? And along with the major milestones and health checks that your project is making satisfactory progress. So that that that's the sort of main part for the sort of research project. As I mentioned earlier on, impact is very important in all research activities now, and therefore you have to show pathways to social. Now we were showing pathways to social economic impact, so that's identifying what these outputs are and how they relate or how they are applicable to uh, sort of now application in the Philippines. And, put, and potentially also the UK. Who are the stakeholders? So now the stakeholders being the agencies that are involved in supporting the funding and also the uh, sort of maybe the companies, the organisations that you will uh, potentially work with in order to take your outputs forward, etc. So that's now that's got to be identified there. There's a section about the collaboration and again, that's a condensed document of detailing who's involved, why they're involved, i.e. the research partnerships, etc. And uh, uh, sort of the roles of each participant and what value they bring, how the management of the collaboration is going to be undertaken and what complementarity and value each, part, each sort of researcher brings to the, the sort of programme of work and ultimately maintaining continuity once the program ends. How do you take that forward and ensure that the outputs of the research have longevity and actually can be applied? The final section is budget detailing, and that's just the justification of the eligible chargeable costs. So please read the documentation because you just cannot charge everything and anything to uh, sort of projects, so you need to know what is legitimate charge costs and what are not legitimate costs. So all in all, uh, it was a relatively straightforward process. I know the submission time is the 12th of June for this year, um, which is quite tight, but it's not impossible. So don't let that put you off. So thank you uh, for taking the time and uh, hopefully you've got some useful information from the presentation I've given. I'll stop sharing my screen now, Danny.
Danny can't hear you. Danny, you're muted. Oh, thank you. Um, you're muted again, Danny. That's it. Okay. Seems some. Okay, someone may have muted me. Okay, so to continue, um, before I proceed with the uh, question and answer, I'm glad to uh, inform you that we are also doing live tweets through uh, Twitter, uh, through our Twitter account at PH British. You may share tweets about uh, this webinar and use hashtag Education Connects Us and hashtag Newton Agham. We also recognize that there are over 300 attendees this afternoon. I have mentioned some institutions a while ago, but uh, to include, we have friends from UP Diliman, Baguio City, um, Indanao State University, General Santos City, uh, Central Luzon State University, people from University of Asia and the Pacific, from FAOUN Philippines, San Beda University, from DTI Expert Marketing Bureau, thank you for attending. From PUP Manila, from Cagayan de Oro, Univer uh, Cagayan de Oro City, uh, we have attendees from the University of Bath in the UK. Um, from USEP Dav Davao City, from Philippine Center for Post Harvest Development and Mechanization, Science City of Munoz, uh, Nueva Ecija. We have uh, attendees from Livestock Biotechnology Center, Philippines, from the Food for the Hunger Philippines, Dagasal University, and a lot more. We are overwhelmed by the support. Thank you, everyone. Now for uh, the question and answer, the first question is directed to uh, Dr. Devi. Uh, sir, um, the, the question sent to us anonymously is, how long did the preparation take um, from the time the research proposal was submitted until the project was implemented. And if you can uh, still recall, how much um, do uh, the projects one and two cost? Okay, uh, I think for the first project, uh, we got approval by uh, late 2015. And the project was actually to be implemented in January 2016. So we had one year to, to prepare for it. Okay. I, I think for the second project, uh, probably a shorter time uh, from project approval to actual uh, implementation. But actually in the second project, we were delayed. And therefore the actual implementation was delayed for about four months for the second project. Okay. Now in terms of the cost, I think the project, you see we had our local costs. The Philippine side, I think for the first project for the workshop, was about maybe 1.5 million pesos. And then for the second project, uh, that was a bit more, about six, seven million pesos. I, I, I can't recall anymore uh, what their budgets were. Okay, thank you, uh, sir. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Um, to, um, to Professor Johnstone, uh, question is, what qualities and experience are UK universities looking for in an international partner or a Filipino partner? Do you want to say something about that? I think um, it, it's sort of complementary uh, sort of uh, to uh, the skill sets and the sort of research capabilities and, and especially vital in all projects is local knowledge. So key uh, to sort of building the collaboration is bringing that uh, sort of ultimately the Philippine partner, bringing the local knowledge and the local understanding of the specific subject area in uh, the Philippines. That is vital uh, to a successful partnership. Thank you. And of course, we recognize that um, your partner for your institutional institutional X project is um, Professor um, Director Inano, Nelson yep. Inano from the Ateneo de Davao University. Yep. So, like, so for, uh, we've got uh, sort of two uh, sort of very good researchers, as Professor Nelson Inano from uh, sort of Antonio de, de Davao University, and there's also uh, Professor Luis Angelo Odano from the University of the Philippines as well. But now both of them bring that sort of complementary local knowledge to our project. All right. Thank you. To, uh, to continue, another question to Dr. Terry. For um, this is sent, okay. For someone new to this searching of collaborations, 
what uh, would you suggest to be a good starting point? Are there particular websites that consolidate these opportunities to help us finding good research topics? And if there is any, could, um, do, you, uh, do you know any of these? You know, you can actually find uh, different sources, including journals for research ideas, particularly if you're familiar with the literature. But I think essentially the starting point of the collaboration is the idea that you have. And then a partner in the UK that believes in that same idea. That's essentially uh, what the starting point really is. And if you don't have an idea yet, uh, you can read the literature and find a problem that you want to solve. But it really has to begin with that. You have to be committed to this problem that you want to solve. It's not just a theoretical problem. As uh, Professor Johnston said, you know, it's the impact eventually on society that you're wanting to have. And therefore, it's more than an academic exercise of research. You want eventually to achieve something that's going to contribute to improving the reality of uh, the present reality that you're faced with. Thank you, Doc. In saying that, how do you think, um, how, how, how important is the connections with government officials then? Um, do you have advice we can give to researchers who may not have had uh, contacts with LGUs or um, different agencies in the Philippines? You know, you can look at the two projects that, we, uh, that I presented. In the first project where we had an, uh, insta the, the workshop links, that was essentially between the Athenaeum School of Medicine and Public Health and uh, the London School. And government really was just one of the audience when we presented the output. But when you think of the second project where we work with uh, Northern Samar, the province, we were working actually with a local government. But you see, the Newton Fund project was initiated because we wanted to further that ongoing collaboration with Northern Samar. So in fact, we already had the collaboration of Northern Samar, and then we used this collaboration with Kiel University to further strengthen that collaboration with the province and to help them develop their health system. All right, thank you. The next question is um, maybe answered by any or both of us, um, both of you. Um, do you think fresh uh, PhD graduates or emerging uh, researchers are um, in, in, in a good position to, to get a good chance in securing funding? Is it about um, that, um, being an emerging or an established researcher for you to get a good uh, chance to uh, for funding? Do you have um, anything to share with it? Let's start with Dr. Kamera. Okay. Uh yeah, yes, I would say, um, like so, with, with all research drivers today, uh, early career researchers and the support of early, uh, early career researchers is uh, key in uh, sort of research activity and is also one of the identified sort of areas within uh, the Newton Fund sort of application process, uh, in identifying early career researchers in your proposal. Um, so I think uh, sort of that is now a very strong position to be in. Um, the second thing associated with that, uh, sort of a recent PhD graduate actually has state of the art understanding of that scientific area and they can bring a lot to that. And especially now sort of irrespective of whether it's a home PhD student or an over now as they've maybe been overseas to do their PhD, um, but they've got that state of the art knowledge and they, they've got a, a, maybe a better appreciation of the applicability of that knowledge to the local environmental uh, sort of application. Thank you. Do you have anything to add? No, I totally agree with uh, what the Professor uh, Cameron said. Um, particularly if you're a researcher and you're trained in research methodology. So you would have, I'm sure, a lot of ideas that you'd like to further. And therefore, what you'd need to do then is to find that collaborator who's going to want to, you might say, further 
the operationalization of this idea through a research project or a work. All right. Thank you, Dr. Reed. The next question is about uh, Professor Johnstone having um, presented about the ODA eligibility. So are there, Pro Professor Johnstone, you may have mentioned this before, but uh, you may want to reiterate, um, are there pr priority areas that the ODA um, will or will not fund? Um, um, can um, can they submit proposals that um, will address ad or that should they submit proposals that will definitely address the uh, national concern which the UK experts can extend their technological knowledge in finding solutions? Ultimately, the ODA eligibility is one of the drivers for the focus of the Newton Fund application process. And therefore, that now sort of within the specific Newton Fund call, that identifies the specific areas that will, that, at that moment now, at that year, that is being targeted and being supported. Therefore, when researchers are preparing. A, a proposal for that, they should also look at the ODA eligibility list to make sure that what is on that list is being addressed in the proposal. Now, whatever the, so the topic area of the research, the topic now they're showing that, that what the research is doing is the one of the outputs is going to have a positive impact if it's applied to the country that the research is undertaken in. So the ODA eligibility is, is a general statement of what the general objectives should be. And if we, now all sort of applicants should make sure they're aware of that eligibility, these eligibility statements and capture not necessarily all of them, but some of them within their proposal. And it's on the ODA website, so it's easily uh, acceptable. Also, the uh, information on the Newton Fund application gives a link to the ODA eligibility examples. So they should read that, and make sure that they address that in their application. All right, thank you. For uh, the Newton Fund part, of course, um, as you mentioned, these um, eligibility requirements are set in the application form and therefore they can review before you know proceeding with um, starting uh, the draft of their uh, proposal. Now, uh, we proceed with the question, uh, which is very interesting for most of us having different difficulties and uh, setbacks. But um, to um, to us, to both speakers, we can begin with Dr. David. Um, what were the most challenging problem you think um, you may have experienced um, during the proposal writing stage? Um, how do you think, um, how do you remember, have you dealt uh, with these? Um, do, do you want me to answer first, Danny, or? Professor, um, Professor. Okay. And, and anyone can answer. Do you want, um, who may want to uh, begin? Do, Dr. David, you go first. Okay. Uh, well, I'm going to uh, allude to uh, the slide of Professor Cameron, where he actually showed the outline of the of the application form uh, the project summary the research project the pathway to social economic impact the collaboration and the budget actually the most challenging phase for us in the writing being very very clear about the research project and the pathway to make impact and the collaboration to crystallizing that that was most important. For example, we had an idea about strengthening primary care in a very poor province. But that what then would be the deliverables for such a project? That was the question that we had to grapple with. And therefore, we then started thinking about the different deliverables that we would have to make, including deliverables of uh, Meeting with these rural health physicians, having conferences, that would be one output. Uh, meeting with the governors uh, and the local governments, those, those should be part of the outputs, but they were intermediate outputs. But in the end, the end deliverable had to do 
we, what had to do with a program that we could use to train these uh, rural health physicians to enhance their skills in primary care. And that curriculum had to somehow be pre-tested as well. So clarifying that was, was really the challenge. We had to be clear among, uh, amongst ourselves what we wanted to do. And at the school, that was best known for the training of general practitioners. And therefore, we saw that nexus that by collaborating with them, they could provide us inputs in how they train their general practitioners. And we wanted to learn from that in the development of a process and of a supplementary curriculum to train our rural health physicians who were essentially general practitioners. So it's that. It's clarifying those ideas and then getting alignment with your partner in the UK. That was the most difficult part. Thank you. Um, Professor Johnston, anything to add, please? The other, the other big challenge is that for your inputs, when you're detailing your project summary, your research project, as in what you will do and how you will do it, you are limited to the number of characters that you can then insert that describe that to typically 5,000 characters, including species. So it's actually, as academics, you like to maybe elaborate in greater detail, but when you're submitting your application, you've got to condense that, now, you, what you're, now sort of your message and what you're getting across into uh, now, in, in, in a lot of the boxes, it's 5,000 characters, including spaces. So it's condensing down your project objectives to get that now sort of solid, robust, but short statements of what it is you will do, how you will do it. That is a challenge. All right, thank you. Of course, here we have um, two speakers um, speaking on their perspective of their specialization. Someone from um, um, the health sciences and another for uh, marine um, sciences. Um, an uh, another question directed to um, to the Newton Fund team is that um, two years ago, um, Researchers from um, Beagle University were developing a proposal with the University of Liverpool on impacts of volcanic activities, but were hampered by Mount Mayon eruption just recent, uh, recent years ago. Um, is that a priority area now that we can pursue for the Newton Fund? Uh, the answer is always yes. As um, um, as natural uh, natural calamities, um, the effect of it. Uh, of natural calamities is included in the priority areas for the Newton Fund, at least in the Philippines. So um, this um, is determined together with our partners and big thanks to our partners in the Philippines, the Department of Science and Technology, the Commission on Higher Education, and uh, just recently, Department of Agriculture, who have been very supportive of the, to us in, um, in ensuring that these priority areas are uh, also directed and, are, and we have um, we, we give priority to um, to for example this um, question on um, impacts of volcanic activities so um, another question for us is does the Newton fund social um, does the Newton fund fund social science research and the answer is um, so long as the um, the, the social science research actually um, is one is ODA eligible and number two would target a, um, would target a problem that would later on help in the economic development of the Philippines and um, be able to um, to get uh, be able to to get the engagement from the UK partners then that would be uh, that could be done there are actual um, research researches funded by the Newton fund in Newton Agham in uh, in previously for example we have there are researches on um, the LGBT there are researches on um, what's uh, mining law, for example, and these were written in a way that um, they have targeted the need of um, communities and, of course, uh, adhering to ODA eligibility. 
All right. We have about because we um we aim to end five minutes before five thirty so that people uh, will be able to fill out uh, the uh, post evaluation assessment. But perhaps we can um, ask one um, more one more question for each of our speakers. Um, final question. I I final question for um, Dr. Dairit is um, do go. Do government systems and structures have bearing on the success of international collaboration initiatives? If they have, how do we make sure that they do not negatively affect output of an international collaboration? Sir? Well, actually, uh, yes. Uh, the effect of uh, government has to do really with the efficiency in which they administer the program. Because in our case, it was the Commission on Higher Education that was administering the program. So if, for example, there are different reason or another, or there are problems that uh, cause those delays, then that's how the, you know, the project's affected uh, negatively. For example, as I said, you know, we had to start late. You know, and I, I don't think we started late because of our fault, but there were problems in the system that caused us to stop late. So that that's essentially where we think uh, government systems can actually uh, impact the implementation of the collaboration. But you have to understand that in this partnership, uh, the Philippines is uh, administered, this Philippine part is, is, is administered in this case, the British Council and, and something else, right? And therefore, uh, you could actually have differences in the efficiency of administration on both sides of the of of, of, of the aisle. Okay, uh, we only hope that really uh, whoever is administering the program, and that's usually government, is able to administer it uh, efficiently. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor, uh, Dr. Derry. And uh, last question for uh, Professor Johnstone. Um, with the um, restrictions in travel under the COVID-19 conditions, how uh, can we pursue the implementation of this project? And I believe this is very timely for you as a new uh, grantee for institutional links. How do you plan to, um, to, to enable your project in the time of um, a pandemic? Okay. Now, sort of obviously, as I mentioned, a, a good IT infrastructure is, is vital. Uh, we now have these platforms like Microsoft Team and Zoom uh, that we can actually progress in the context of meetings. Uh, like so, within the program of work, there is specific work packages. Uh, in our context, you've looked at uh, these work packages and restructured. Uh, the actual uh, sort of timing of these activities. So when like sort of a lot of the computational modeling work, we have instead of waiting till the month uh, sort of eight and ten to start that, we've brought that forward and st uh, sort of started developing our computational models uh, and by restructuring the program. Um, ultimately, because you can't have that physical face to face uh, sort of meeting and that sort of in country engagement with other stakeholders, then that will ultimately sort of drag out the duration in which the program can successfully be delivered over. And ultimately that will involve a submission of an extension request. Uh, and it's not unique. Uh, to Newton Fund programs, it's it's happening within European projects in Europe. It's happening in UK projects as well because the whole COVID nineteen has closed down a lot of uh, near enough every institution for twelve weeks, and therefore there's that knock on delay associated with it. It's just how you manage that and restructure your program of work to minimise that impact. But ultimately, need to be comp now need to be compensated for through a no-cost extension at the uh, sort of at the end of the now extending the end delivery date 
of the project. Right. Thank you so much, um, Professor Johnson. And this is also timely as we um, uh, transition to to end uh, this uh, webinar, the first part of our two part webinar series, because the second part of our webinar series talks about um, what happens for international collaborations in the time of pandemic or post COVID-19. So um, with this, um, on behalf of the British Council in the Philippines, uh, we would like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar on writing a research proposal for international collaboration. Um, thank you again to Professor John Stone and to Dr. Derrick for sharing your experience and your time. We have emailed the post-webinar assessment form and we will appreciate if um, our attendees can accomplish after this webinar. We will email also a summary report of the call soon. Please stand by for the next session of this two-part uh, webinar series and all our future online initiatives. The final part or the second part of the two-part series is scheduled on Thursday. Uh, Thursday next week, 11 June at um, 4 p.m., we will discuss the present and the future of research collaboration in this time of COVID-19. Uh, we will have speakers from the University of Nottingham, um, UK, uh, University of Surrey, UK, and the Dagasal University in Metro Manila. Again, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, we, uh, we hope that uh, you stay safe. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Professor Cameron.